2013. Usually we don't have opportunities to observe comet with, with radar because they just don't come close enough. This one is going to be at about 20, 22 lunar distances and uh, we'll, we'll, you know, we'll be able to get a peek at this type of object. But what is interesting, it is going to be a real treat for the optical observers because there are some indications that there's going to be a really amazing meteor shower uh, caused by this comet. So this comet is periodic comet, and um, Earth is going to pass through the trails of that this comet deposited in 1800s. And uh, in May of next year, uh, there is supposed to be a really nice meteor shower, and we will also get to observe the object that produced this meteor shower. All right, I have another asteroid watch question, either from Marina or Paul. I know how you find them, but how do you work out its trajectory based on a single lens scope? Well, it's not just a single observation. We actually collect all the observations, and there could be hundreds of them uh, for a well-observed object, and we fold them all into the math of the known gravity fields of the sun and all of the planets, and we figure out which is the orbit okay. that will so fit I'm, all okay. of those no best. So, and there's some uncertainty, of course. There always will be some because the observations are not perfect, but we get a very good idea. The uh, more observations, the better. We'll get a very good idea of the orbit and uh, at a particular time, and then we will project that into the future as well. All right, so we're going to wrap up some of these questions for now. And we'd like to thank Marina for helping us out with some of these asteroid questions. Thank you so much. And some of these questions were very good and very sharp. They, they are already aware of how we track asteroids. They are more interested on how exactly do we figure out the orbits. So we're going to move on ahead now. Asteroids are a very high priority at NASA for a number of different reasons to protect the planet, as Paul told us, to understand how the solar system formed because it holds the elements that were the very, very beginning of our formation, and to explore it as a possible resource that one day we could possibly mine these asteroids. To tell us more, it is my pleasure to introduce the administrator of NASA, Charles Bolden. He joins us now from NASA headquarters in Washington, D.C. Administrator Bolden, thanks so much for taking some time out for us. Thank you very much for letting me come to you. I don't know whether, uh, whether I'm coming through or not, but uh, I've, I've had an opportunity to listen to some of the questions and, uh, and the comments that have been going on, and I find it quite enlightening. You know, um, as we get more and more excited about every opportunity to to see an asteroid or a comet or learn more about it, uh, we find that NASA's present strategy for dealing with asteroids is falling more into line. I would remind everyone that in our 2014 budget request, the president actually added an additional $20 million, bringing us up to a grand total of $40 million for what I consider to be the most critical effort right now, which is uh, identification and characterization of uh, near-Earth asteroids, particularly Earth-threatening asteroids, um, those that, that we know very little about and, and know not enough about the number, size, uh, characteristics of them. Uh, we mentioned in our 2014 budget also that we, were, we would put aside $105 million uh, to begin or to continue our effort to do three things. Uh, one, identification and characterization. Second, which is sort of new, would be actually uh, rendezvousing with and trying to redirect an asteroid, uh, sort of in response to our, our question that we always get about, can we protect the planet? The answer to that is no right now. Uh, but if we're able to demonstrate that humans are able to redirect an asteroid or, or deflect it in some slight way, we may be getting close to the day that we say, yes, we can protect the planet. And then the third segment of that strategy is uh, to utilize SLS and MPCV or our heavy lift rocket and multi-purpose crew vehicle in development right now uh, to take an, astro an astronaut crew uh, into cislunar space in a, in a stable orbit where we would have relocated the asteroid to actually do some human interaction with an asteroid. All of this in uh, sort of meeting the president's challenge to put humans with an asteroid by 2025. I, I don't need to tell this audience, uh, NASA has a long, long, long history of investigation and study of asteroids. Uh, 
We work with our international partners. For example, the, the Japanese uh, very successful with their Hayabusa mission in bringing back uh, a sample. We have OSIRIS-REx Osiris that we're all excited about that's going to launch uh, in the next few years and then bring us back a sample in the 2020s. Um, and we also are currently watching uh, Dawn, the, the Dawn spacecraft, wind its way away from Vesta where it made amazing discoveries onto Cirrus that I am told is an asteroid, but some people may even classify as a minor, as a, as a, a minor planet or a, a dwarf planet. So there's a lot of excitement ahead, and I just want to thank you all for letting me join this team today to talk a little bit about what NASA's doing. So I, I think you're probably going to move on to questions or something, and I'll, yes, I'll stand by. Yes, I have one for you right now. How does the asteroid initiative fit into this overall agency plan to go to Mars and beyond? Gay, it, um, the asteroid strategy, if you will, consists of three segments, as I, as I just mentioned. And very briefly, for the sake of redundancy, let me, let me mention what they are again. The first part of the strategy, the critical part for us, is identification and characterization of, of as many asteroids in our solar system as we can. The ones we're primarily interested in and the ones that the folk out of JPL and other, other NASA centers are working on is identifying those that are Earth-threatening, the, the near-Earth objects that, are, that at some point may, may have a potential to impact Earth or uh, impact some of the satellites that are orbiting Earth. So that's, that's the first segment. The president has, has proposed $40 million for that in the 2014 budget. The second segment that we're proposing, which is new, is to actually utilize, continue our development of solar electric propulsion, new propulsion techniques, to rendezvous with and actually try to redirect a small asteroid uh, or a small piece of an asteroid to the lunar vicinity, what we call cislunar or some people call it translunar space, so it would be in a counter-rotating orbit of the moon, putting it close enough that, that within a reasonable amount of time, we could launch an astronaut crew that would go rendezvous in lunar orbit with this asteroid and do the third segment, uh, which would be to actually have human interaction with an asteroid. It, it is still to be decided whether that's robotic uh, human interaction where the crew never has to leave the vehicle or whether we venture out on an EVA and do some some direct intervention or, or interaction with it, uh, like physically taking samples by hand so that we can bring them back to Earth. Um, one thing I will tell, or s some clarification that I will tell people, this is not a science strategy. This is not a human exploration strategy. It's not a technology development strategy. It is for perhaps the first time uh, a synergized strategy that pulls together everything that NASA does and does so well. And it even involves our aeronautics mission directorate because that's the home of, of, of our knowledge of fundamental hypersonics research. Uh, and every time you leave and return to the planet or go to another planet nowadays, uh, we're utilizing what the aeronautics folk teach us about hypersonics research. So it's exciting for us. I hope it's exciting for all of our employees because they're going to be doing a taste of everything. And, and as always happens there, nobody's going to be perfectly happy, but everybody hopefully will get a piece of this pie. Well, speaking of synergy, you, you mentioned that a lot of different pieces will be fitting together different NASA centers, but other U.S. agencies perhaps, perhaps international partnerships? What are we talking about? Gay, it is our hope, and, and we have already begun the effort of working collaboratively with other agencies of the government, uh, whether it's the Department of Energy, uh, on and on and on, uh, and we have also engaged our international partners. One of the first sets of calls that I made on the morning uh, that we were rolling our budget out was to the heads of, of, of our partner agencies on the International Space Station. And there are, there are five big agencies that, that predominantly run the International Space Agency. Uh, the Russian Space Agency, JAXA from Japan, Canadian Space Agency, the European Space Agency, which is huge. Uh, Jean-Jacques Dodin is, the, is the, the, um, the head of the European Space Agency, which encompasses uh, more than 20 different nations in Europe and then the United States through NASA. But all of them were briefed on this concept. All of them were very receptive. Uh, and everybody's waiting to see how we're going to formulate the, the actual details of the mission. So mission formulation will begin uh, later this, this summer. 
uh, and hopefully we will be able to come out and, and brief the American public on a little bit more meaty concept sometime next fall or, or winter. All right. Well, we promised our audience that we would also give you a social media question. So here is one, and it could be a tough <laughs> one for you. It's they if, usually are. <laughs> yeah, they are. If an asteroid was to collide with Earth, is there anything we could do about it? Gay, unfortunately for the for the questioner, um, the answer is no. Right now, the and let's let's not say that we we work with FEMA today with the Federal Emergency Management Agency. We work with the Department of State. We work with the Department of Defense. When we get indications, and it is NASA usually that gets the first indications that a near-Earth object is inbound, whether it's junk falling from space, as we have had happen several times over the past 12 to 14 months, or whether it is really an asteroid, uh, as was the case uh, a few months ago, we, we notify our partner agencies if it's one that looks like its trajectory is going to bring it and potentially impact Earth. Uh, we work as diligently as we can with other agencies to get an ac as accurate a prediction of the entry point and potential impact point as we can so that, the, so that FEMA can then begin to work if it's going to impact uh, the continental, the United States, or so the State Department can begin to act if, it, if we think that it's going to impact one of our one another nation of the world because these are not national threats these are these are global threats and so uh, we have already had to do this many times in the past um, and and it seems to have worked relatively well uh, we were surprised I think as everybody knows by the by the small asteroid that that surprised us over Russia about two or three months ago um, but that's what we're trying to avoid with increased effort on identification and characterization is it so that we're not surprised by something that can can impact earth uh, but the, the the mitigation the actual ability to protect earth uh, is not within our technological grasp right now and that's that's why this the asteroid strategy and the second segment of of actually a, a, an effort to redirect an asteroid is so so important to the world not just to the u.s and we heard it from you. It's not a, an easy thing to answer, <laughs> but there are steps being made in that direction, and that's the most important thing. Yes, very much so. All right. Well, thank you so much for the update, Administrator Bolden. We appreciate you carving out a little bit of your day just for us and to be a part of our program. Thanks so much. Okay, thanks so very much for letting me be a part of the program, and, and, and thanks to all of the folk around the NASA family uh, who, who work at this so diligently every day. Um, my visit to JPL, for example, last week was vi really, really, really enlightening and informative to me. And uh, it's always good to meet with a bunch of people that, that are passionate about things like saving the earth the way that you all are out there. Thank you very much. Oh, it's a pleasure having you a part of the show. Thank you. And so we have a few more um, social media questions that I can have you field, Paul, if you're okay. And some of them are kind of tough. Um, how far can we watch an incoming asteroid and get an early warning? Well, that would depend on how big it is, um, and it would also depend on its sort of orbit. This was an eccentric orbit for QE2. We had a chance to see it 15 years ago, and we discovered it then when it was relatively near the Earth. Uh, we, we would be able to see many of these, many orbits before they would hit the Earth if, if it was on a co collision course. So the idea is to discover them as early as possible. Um, the earlier we find them, the more warning time we have. More information. Well, that wraps things up for us here at JPL. We'd like to thank the folks at the South Africa Astronomical Observatory in Sutherland, the radar scientists and the team at Goldstone. Of course, Paul Chodas, Steve Whistler, and Doug Ellison here at JPL in Mission Control. And we, and of course, Administrator Bolden. And we look forward to all the exciting results ahead. Now, if you're interested in more information about asteroids, here are two websites to check out nasa.gov slash asteroids or you can follow us on twitter at twitter.com slash asteroid watch thanks for watching everyone